Hello everyone, hey good evening and welcome to another episode of The Front. Tonight it's Wednesday night, which means it's time for another live leadership lesson. My name is Mike Phillips and I will be your host. Couple quick reminders, please check out the website at leadtheteam.net for free sales training, motivational content and to level up your leadership. And uh, I would really appreciate it if you do that. Also, check out the YouTube channel at leadtheteam.tv. I release a couple videos each week on that YouTube channel. I have links to the podcast, everything there, so you can catch up either on individual training sessions or these once a week live leadership lessons. So tonight, I have got a very esteemed, absolutely amazing guest. It's my friend, Mr. George Chanos. He's the former Attorney General of Nevada, and we're going to be getting with him right after after this. Thanks for tuning in to Lead the Teams, The Front. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so that you're the first to know about new episodes, uploads, and when I go live. That's right. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in and join us tonight. Just here on my left is Mr. George Chanos. George, how are you doing this evening? Thanks for joining me tonight, man. I'm wonderful, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first off, let's dive right into it. You know, uh, there's some people in my audience that may not be familiar with with George. George is uh, clearly, as it's stated, so it has to be true because you read it here. He's an author. He's a speaker. He's a motivator. He is the 31st form, uh, Attorney right. General of Nevada, right? So yep. if you would, for our viewers out there in, in internet land, George, if you would just kind of give them a brief history of who you are, your business background, uh, maybe a little bit of your family background, and then we'll dive into tonight's leadership lesson. Okay, so um, I grew up in originally in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Uh, my family immigrated uh, from Greece, uh, my grandfather. Uh, my father was born here and my mother as well. Um, she's from Minnesota and was Norwegian. And um, so I was raised there and then uh, moved west and ultimately um, uh, attended school both in Wisconsin and in Nevada and in California. And uh, I went to law school at the uh, University of San Diego. I, I worked for Senator Paul Laxalt of Nevada in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the U.S. Senate and um, and then went to law school at USD Law School, graduated from there, worked for a 700 plus international law, uh, uh, 700 plus lawyer international law firm, and then opened up my own practice in Las Vegas and ultimately was um, asked by the governor to serve as Nevada's attorney general. And I served in that capacity, um, argued before the United States Supreme Court and uh, spent 30 years of my life uh, advising uh, business owners and, and high net worth individuals and people from all walks of life, uh, including governors and billionaires and shop owners sure. on um, how to solve their problems. And now I'm writing and speaking. So you, you've you gone from being a, uh, well, I guess for a lot of your life, you would have been a professional problem solver. And you've gone from being a professional Absolutely. problem solver to being a professional problem solver. And then- Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, it's very I, true. It's yeah. very true. So I, I'm going to real quick give you a plug early too. And I know that, that but you were kind enough uh, because uh, as uh, for my audience out there, uh, as you see, George is an author and he was kind enough to send me a copy of his book, Seize Your Destiny. So c can you just uh, real quick, maybe share a little bit as you are getting into more speaking and authoring. And that's a little bit of how you and I connected because Facebook knows yes. us better than we know us. It says you two guys are leaders and should connect. Uh, so yes. fill us in a little bit about how, how that book came to be because you and I were talking beforehand and I think the story yes. is awesome. So in, in 2012, I had uh, an unexpected heart attack. I had undiagnosed high blood pressure. And as a consequence of the heart attack, I began to put my affairs in order. I had a 16-year-old daughter at the time, and I had a 21-year-old nephew. And um, so in, in putting my affairs to, in, together, I thought that one of the most valuable assets that I had to share with my children was my knowledge. And so after setting up a trust and deciding where my financial assets would go, I started to write a letter. And that letter, um, because I like to write, I looked down one day and I had 100 pages in the letter and I thought, you know, this isn't a letter, this is a book. 
And so I made it into a book. And ultimately what Seize Your Destiny is, it's everything that you would want your kids to know. It's, it's not only the core, ancient core values of character, courage, commitment, compassion. Um, it talks about all of that, but it also talks about what you can expect in the future in terms of artificial intelligence, um, advances in genomics, 3D printing. It talks about how to lead a happy, successful, and meaningful life, and how to put a plan together, how to decide what it is that you're good at, how to, how to identify your strengths and your weaknesses, um, and how to move forward and execute on that plan um, with courage and determination, how to overcome your fears, so that's essentially what Seize Your Destiny is about. And I, I think the whole premise behind the book is just absolutely phenomenal. I, like, like I said, I've read a little bit of it and was so impressed with just the, the ways that you started it. Certainly our conversation uh, leading up to this point, I'm, I'm super excited about it. So um, a, a couple things as, as you're talking about it, the, the things that you know, you said you want your kids to know that the next generation to know what uh, what would you say right now it is that you are best known for? Well, if there was one or two things, what are those one or two things that they say? Oh, yeah, that's George Chanos right there. What the, what are those things that are going to maybe down the line be your legacy? Well, what what I was best at as a lawyer was my ability to negotiate and resolve disputes um, and to strategize, to develop a strategy um, for my clients that would lead them to achieve their goals. So um, I employed what, what I call a helicopter perspective. In, okay. in his book, Ogilvy, Ogilvy on Advertising, David Ogilvy, who is, is widely considered the father of, of modern day advertising, talks about this thing called a helicopter perspective. And essentially a helicopter perspective is an ability to rise above a problem and look at the problem from multiple perspectives, ideally from all perspectives, so that you gain a more thorough understanding of the problem. And then in looking at the problem, thinking outside the box creatively to try to come up with options and solutions that can satisfy your objectives, um, often in a creative way. And I've employed that throughout my life on behalf of my clients. Um, judges often do this. Good judges do this. When they have two people come in and present their claims, they look at both claims. They look at the entire picture, um, where most of us look at just our side of the equation, our thought processes. Sure. Um, in a negotiation, we might think, you know, it's our responsibility to look out for our interests. It's the other side's responsibility to look out for their interests. Um, I don't see it that way. I try to look out for both my side of the equation and the other side's uh, interests in a way that I can create a win-win situation, something that fully satisfies or exceeds my needs, but also provides benefit to the other side as well. So if, if possible, creating a win-win situation. So that's probably what I'm best known for in, in practicing law. So when you're saying you do have a, a unique perspective, I think when it comes to business and leadership from dealing with, or I, I shouldn't say dealing with, I should say working with judges and, and other attorneys, you know, and, and that perspective, what would you say are some of the most valuable lessons you picked up along the way? Like when you, when you were, were practicing maybe prior to being the attorney general or even as being the attorney general, what is one pinpoint target that you'd say, man, that was a really valuable lesson that I learned maybe later in life from some of those experiences? The, the, the I guess um, one of the most important lessons that I learned, I, I'm kind of uh, multidimensional when you, when you really get to know me. And, I can and, see that. You know, you can, but you can see the art behind me, right? So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an artist as well. So I'm not only analytical, but I'm also creative. So I paint, I do sculptural assemblage, I collect art, I collect other things. So I have a, a very strong creative side. And one of the things that I found is that creativity is often not employed as often as it should be in in negotiations or in business transactions, option mm -hmm. generation, for example. 
Sure. You know, I'll give you a, I'll give you a quick example of a, of a story. I, um, I bought a piece of property and uh, it was three and a half acres and I paid two and a half million dollars for the property. And um, I went to my neighbor and I wanted to buy his property. And his property was, uh, um, so mine was three and a half acres that I bought for two and a half million. His was three acres, less than mine, mm -hmm. right next door. And I asked him how much he wanted and he wanted 10 million. And I said, geez, I just closed a transaction on a property that's optimistic. right next door. Yeah, that's bigger <laughs> than yours, right? It's, it's sure. a half acre larger than yours. It's right next door. And I bought it for two and a half million. I'll tell you what, I'll sell you my larger property for 10 million. And he said, no, I wouldn't pay 10 million. I just want to receive 10 million. And I said, well, you know, uh, that's understandable. You know, we all want to receive 10 million. So um, I said, well, why don't we do this? So I tried to be creative. I tried to come up with a creative solution. I said, you name the price. I don't care what the price is. It can be 5 million, it can be 100 million, name whatever price you want and I'll decide whether I'm a buyer or a seller. So you get to decide the fair price and I get to decide whether I buy your property at that price or sell you mine at that price. And he said, hmm. no, I won't do that. So, so most people probably would have said, okay, well, we're done. You know, uh, I can't get this guy to sell his property and they would have walked away. What I did was I took it a step further. I said, what if we were to join our properties together there's a cul-de-sac that runs between our two properties. If we join our two properties together, there won't be any need for that cul-de-sac and possibly we could get the city to vacate that cul-de-sac, which would increase the combined holding by an acre and a half. And guess what? We can list that combined property for $20 million and maybe you'll get your 10 million and maybe I'll get 10 million as well. And the guy said, I'll do it on one condition. And I said, what's that condition? And he said, I'll do it if you allow my son to list the property. And I said, done. So I allowed his son to list the property. Within four months, we had the property in escrow for $20 million. Escrow closed a year later. Escrow closed a year later at $20 million. And uh, he made his 10 million and I made my 10 million. But it was the and his son won too. What did his son make on the deal? Son, right. <laughs> and, his, and his son won too. And good for him. I'm happy, you know, happy for him and his son. So, the, the, but the moral of the story is mm -hmm. is that you don't walk away from a deal where somebody says no. You you come up with a more creative alternative to get them to say yes. And so that's one of the more important lessons that I've learned throughout my career is that option generation, cre sure. creating, coming up with creative options that are high value to the people that you're dealing with and low cost to you is a great way to, to uh, negotiate deals and get deals closed. And I've, I've been using that technique for many years uh, to, with you know, pretty substantial success. So, if, yeah, I can imagine it's a very substantial success based on the, this conversation. What, so if that's something that's worked for you as an individual, George, you know, certainly it's one thing for us as individuals to uh, to be creative. And especially when we have that interest in it, how how are you able to or are you able to, you know, communicate that and and have that creativity transcend to other people that you might be coaching and leading, what are some, some ways you encourage that creative thinking within others as well? So, so the first thing that you have to do is understand that, that this is an avenue that's available to you, right? So sure. if, you, if, you, if you look at negotiation as just positional negotiation, you state your position, they state their position, and then you gradually move together from your respective positions, that's a very you know simplistic form of negotiation and a mm -hmm. rather boring form of negotiation, right? It's sure. it's called it's called it's called positional negotiation. So I went back to to I, I graduated from law school in San Diego at USD, but I went back in ten years later. I studied um, 
uh, at Harvard Law School, I studied negotiation um, from a guy, a professor named Roger Fisher, who wrote the book Getting to Yes and uh, is one of the leading authorities on negotiation. And he talked about, so what I described for you as the norm is, is, is positional negotiation. And what Fisher um, was a proponent of was a, what he called principled negotiation. And in principled negotiation, you look beyond people's positions and you look at their interests. So what are the underlying interests that you may have that support the position that you've articulated? So you might come into my office and you might say, I want to raise. And I might say, okay, well, you know, how much do you want? And you say, well, I want $20,000. I want a $20,000 raise. And I say, um, okay, well, why do you, so, so now it could, I could, I could, not ask any other questions. I could just look at your request for $20,000 and say, you know, I'll give you 10 or I'll give you five or, or no, you don't deserve a raise or, you know, let's just talk about the number. You could say yes that, too, George. You could say yes too. Yeah, yeah I, could say, I could say yes, but that's not likely. That's not likely okay. that I'm just going to say yeah, that, that, that I or anybody else is just going to say yes. So, so, you know, people, we all like to negotiate. Everybody tries to negotiate. So somebody comes in asking for X, you're, you're typically going to counter with Y. What if I took a different tack? And what if I asked you, what are the underlying interests that you have in, in asking for that $20,000 raise? Why do you want that $20,000 raise? And let's sure. say you told me, let's say you told me, um, well, you know what? I, uh, I want to send my, my oldest child to college and they're going to be heading off to college this year. And uh, they want to go to, you know, and, and then I might ask, well, what school? And they might say, well, they want to go to the University of San Diego. And I might say, you know something? My good friend is the dean at the University of San Diego. Or I know somebody who's a professor at the University of San Diego. Or, you know, I, I have a, or our company has a scholarship fund for employees whose children are going to college. Or there may be other ways where I can add tremendous value to you, meeting your underlying interest of, of helping pay for your son's college tuition mm -hmm. and not have to give you the $20,000 raise, but give you a value that exceeds $20,000. Let's say I could get your son into college for free by making a phone call. That would cost me nothing. I'd save $20,000 and you would make, uh, you would have a benefit that exceeds the $20,000 that you asked for. Wouldn't that be a wonderful win-win situation? It would be wonderful because I have a son that's about ready to head to college. So I'm gonna have to call you after this conversation yeah. and then <laughs> figure out what it, who, who else you know. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. So let let me let me shift gears a little bit on you, if if I may here, because uh, you know, because the goal of this is live leadership lessons. I think one of the benefits, one of the things you bring to the table, is the fact there is a a, a give and take to leadership. There is a a negotiation from time to time to leadership, which I think is a very unique perspective. Let me ask you a question. What would you say is one characteristic that anybody that is in a leadership role should have character okay so i would i would say character first of all um you know being somebody who who's honest and forthright and dependable and predictable and um somebody who's a a man of their word or a person of their word um that is what inspires people to follow you and to listen right. to you and to want to work for you. People need to know that they can trust you and, and that you're, that if you say something, you're going to do it. And so I think that that would fundamentally be one of, one of my top, um, uh, character traits or, uh, um, things that I would want to see in, in not only an employee, but in a leader in, in any human being that I do business with. So, uh, that would be the starting point for me is integrity and character. Beyond that, I look for competence. Um, I want somebody that is intelligent and, mm -hmm. and uh, that has good judgment, that makes good decisions. Um, and then beyond that, I want somebody who's motivated and committed. I want somebody who's going to work hard. 
I want somebody who's going to persevere and overcome challenges and difficulties and understand that uh, achieving great things is not something that happens naturally. It, it happens as a consequence of, of character, courage, commitment, compassion, and, and you know, going after your goals relentlessly and continuing to persevere through adversity, overcoming your fears, taking action. These are all things that I think are critical to leadership and to success in life. And I talk about these things in the book at length. I think every one of those is absolutely fantastic. So let's say that you get somebody that has all of those traits. They've got character, they've got integrity, they're competent. You get them in uh, on board, somebody that you you would do business with. Because I don't want to focus on the people that uh, don't fit in that. You know, you because there are, there, quite frankly, there are a lot of people that get into leadership roles that don't have that character that don't have that integrity you know we right. we talked some uh beforehand i won't go there at the, at the moment but we talked some beforehand about you know there are certain uh people that are able to work their way into those positions so let's say that you have somebody that has all of the good qualities that you would want in in a leader or in an employee or in a a, uh, a friend you know someone that you would okay. want to do do business with but they they start to stumble, they start to struggle. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges that no matter how golden the person may be, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see that they could face in today's environment? Well, first of all, the, the, the challenges are, are you know too numerous to mention. We're, we're living in, in the most extraordinary period in human history. And, Absolutely. And, the, and the, the change that is coming over the next 30 years is, is mind boggling. Um, you know, guys like Ray Kurzweil, who, who Bill Gates says no, knows more about artificial intelligence than anyone he knows. Ray Kurzweil tells us that by uh, 2012, um, as early as 2012, um, artificial intelligence may exceed human intelligence in an event called the singularity. And Kurzweil tells us that by the 2040s, which is only 30 years away or less than 30 years away, that artificial intelligence will be a billion times more capable than human intelligence. Now think about that for a moment and think about the changes that that will usher in. If you have an intelligence that is a billion times more capable than the smartest human being, than Albert Einstein or Stephen Hawking, and, and you have an intelligence that is a billion times more capable than them, what will that intelligence be able to achieve? There's really, it really exceeds our ability to comprehend what that intelligence will be capable of achieving. Um, there's a guy named Aubrey de Grey who tells us that, uh, of the SENS Research Foundation, who tells us that the first person who will live to a thousand is alive today. So the changes, sure. that, we, the changes that we are going to see are going to be dramatic. I mean, like sea changes, uh, um, seismic changes. And, and so what are, the, what are some of the challenges that I see? Um, I see enormous just a, opportunity. Just immediate I, <laughs> challenges. I see, uh, I, I, see, <laughs> I, see, I see enormous opportunity and I see enormous challenges. So, um, so, so let's say you have this person that, that you've described mm -hmm. and they, are, you know, they have character and they're hardworking and they have good sure. ideas. Um, how do they... Uh, uh, overcome these challenges and seize these opportunities. Um, part of what they need to do is they need to believe. They need to believe in themselves. They need to believe in their future. They need to believe in each other. And uh, so belief is critical. Oprah Winfrey was interviewed at uh, Stanford University in 2014. Mm -hmm. And she was asked about the failures of her philanthropic investments in Africa. And she was asked why she failed, why, why the libraries and the girls' schools that she built did not succeed. And she said, in order to succeed, she said, what I learned was that in order to succeed, you first have to change the way a person thinks. In order to succeed, you have to have a sense of hopefulness, a sense of aspiration. You have to believe in the possibility of success. So that's a starting point. So you have to believe in yourself. I have tremendous belief in myself. 
Um, the other thing, I saw another interesting in, in, in interview from uh, um, Desmond Tutu, Archbishop De Desmond Tutu, mm -hmm. uh, recently. And he was talking about uh, his success. And they asked him, you know, are you a great man? And he said, uh, you know, what does that mean? What is a great man? And he said, you know, for every person that sticks out, there's somebody whose shoulders they stood upon. And so, you know, whether it's your father or whether, you know, in my case, I had, I had a number of, of people in my life that helped me. Um, my, my father was not wealthy, but he was a man of integrity he, and, and he gave me my integrity. And that's probably the most, you know, important gift that anybody can give someone. So I got that from my father. Um, my father had brothers um, and, and they were like fathers to me. He had two brothers, so my, I had sure. two uncles. And so it was really like having three fathers. And then my mother got divorced and she remarried and she remarried a wonderful man. And he became a, third, a, a fourth uh, male figure in my life. And so my success is not born out of you know something special about me so much as it is that that I benefited from from the example and the inspiration of those around me, and you know as I look today I see that there are a lot of young people. There are 17 and a half million fatherless children in the United States, and there are mm -hmm. four million homeless children in the United States, and I wonder who's advising them. You know, um, there are single moms that are trying heroically to help their children and, um, and, and want nothing but the best for them. Um, but there needs to be other figures in people's lives that pick up the mantle and, and be those positive influences that I had. Um, other young people need those same positive influences. And so this is one of the reasons that I'm doing what I'm doing now is I'm 60 years old and I'm devoting this later part of my life to teaching essentially, to writing and to speaking and to try to, instead of advising, you know, billionaires and governors and, and wealthy high net worth individuals, I'm trying to broaden my reach and advise young people all over the world and uh, see if I can, you know, be one of those positive influences for them. And I would encourage anybody watching this who's an adult, whether an adult male or an adult female, um, you can be that source of inspiration for someone, someone you know, um, someone who, uh, who doesn't have that source of inspiration and can benefit from it. Um, you can provide that. And I'd like to inspire other people to pick up that mantle and, and do what I'm trying to do, which is give back a little bit and and see if you can you know help somebody have a better life and i really think that that's part of the answer to society's challenges is that we not leave people on their own to you know fend for themselves and 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 you know whatever happens to them happens to them instead we take an interest in each other and we believe in each other and we help each other and uh so that's part of my message I, you know, so often as I'm interviewing people, George, I said, and I just listen in awe because that I, I've openly said to many people, that's, that's uh, my only ulterior motive is one, I love making the program. And two, I love learning from people just like you. And I think uh, the message is so powerful, the message of mentorship and growing other people. And there is so much value in having really good people influence others to come along. And so uh, God bless you for that. I think that's f just a, a great message and, and it, it really is phenomenal. On, on the tail end of this here, let me, let me ask you one other, in addition to mentors, uh, well, no, I'm just gonna leave it right there because I think that's a really good, I really think that is a good close to, to kind of where we're at, if that's okay for today. Sure. Do you have anything else to, to add before we take it out? Otherwise, you know, certainly by all means, I'm gonna recommend everybody again to, to pick up George's book, Seize Your Destiny. And then what's the best way for people to, to contact you and, and share the, the website for yourself and the book and, and such, if you would. Right. So my name is, is on, uh, on the um, screen, um, George J. Chanos. 
Um, so you can go to georgejchanos.com um, and you can reach out to me. Uh, I have a, uh, a newsletter that I'm going to be putting together. You can sign up for that free newsletter and I'm going to try to continue to inform and inspire. And uh, I would love you to follow me on social media. Um, reach out to me on Facebook or on Instagram uh, or on Twitter. And, um, and I will be doing more of what we're doing today. I will be imparting information. I'm, I'm constantly reading and researching. I'm trying to look ahead and I'm trying to advise more than just a handful of people. I'm, you know, rather than work as I have in the past over the last 30 years, uh, with clients on an individual basis, I'm trying to broaden my reach. I'm trying to reach out to the public in general and provide advice and guidance. And if you think you can profit from that advice and guidance, um, it's free to you uh, on my website. There's there's tons of blog posts that I've written on everything, you know, from uh, um, gun control to, um, you know, a uh, uh, hundred other topics. And look at those articles and read those articles. And uh, the book, Seize Your Destiny, is available on Amazon.com or on BarnesandNoble.com. And I'm coming out with a new book in 2019 called Millennial Samurai, which I expect to be um, really something special. So I'd encourage you to look out for that. And if you, if you connect with me, then you'll, you'll know when that book hits the shelves. Absolutely. So I would encourage you, anybody who's watching, please make sure that you check out George, uh, check out his, his books. Like I said, the first or like he said, the first one, Seize Your Destiny, is out on Amazon right now. And then he's got another one next year. And uh, from the, the sounds of it, when we were talking beforehand, uh, no chance you're slowing down anytime soon. So no. <laughs> Well, George, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, tune in with me and, and share with my audience today, share your insight and your wisdom. I think it's been absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate this opportunity to, to speak to your audience. And I love what you're doing. And I love seeing someone like you following their passion. And, you know, it, it, for me and, and for you, it's not about the money. It's it's we love doing what we're doing. And absolutely. Um, you know, I don't care if I make any money off the book. This is this is something that I want to do, and it's part of my legacy, and it's important to me. And and just like what you're doing is important, um, you know, we're trying to just do a little bit to help other people, and uh, that's a good thing. It absolutely is a good thing. So thanks again, George. I appreciate it. Hey, for everybody who took the time to tune in and join us today for this live leadership lesson with my new friend, George Chanos, absolutely, what a bunch of great wisdom and insight. And I think uh, as he was taking it out there at the end, the, the talk about mentorship and role models, I think is so valuable. I'm going to echo what he said. If you can get involved with somebody else, regardless of what their age is, it can be, you know, we're, we're talking y younger generation. But if you're somebody that has some some wisdom to instill into somebody else, do that. Help grow them, help move them, help bring them along. I think that is so uh, just valuable and so powerful. So thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in and join us today for this live leadership lesson from the front. Remember, I do this every single Wednesday and Sunday. I would love for you to check it out. It's uh, leadtheteam.tv. And then I have some other podcasts and stuff headed out for 2019 also. Time to re-up. So I'd love for you to check them out and join me. Until we speak next, I hope you have an absolutely fantastic day. We'll talk to you soon, everybody.